Chase Mullen, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Jeff. We're glad to be here with you. Uh, I'm very excited. I've, I've got you like all over the place these days. In my front yard, you're on my screen. That's what I was just thinking too. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be on both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me too. I'm really excited. So uh, introduce yourself to the audience. Sure, yeah. So my name, I'm Chase Mullen, obviously. I'm founder and CEO of Mullen. Um, we're a New Orleans-based landscape um, you know, design build and maintenance company. I started the company in 2007, um, bootstrapped it like probably many of you who are listening. You know, I was, I was the first and only employee. And now currently we're right under 200 people, 15 years in business. That's tremendous growth. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah obviously it, it takes a team. So I'm, I'm proud of the team that we built. So I think I started my consulting 2007, 2008, right, uh, right in the dip, right? Mm -hmm. You were kind of right before the dip. Exactly. <clears throat> what was that like? Could take us back to then and how you thought about it, why you started. Yeah, perfect. So, so again, and you can really appreciate this as a, a New Orleanian now, Jeffrey, but I started Mullen kind of in the, the wake of Hurricane Katrina. Katrina came, I was a, a student at UNO. I was majoring in exercise physiology, um, frankly, because I liked working out. I didn't really know what I was going to do with this college degree that I was pursuing. I just, you know, that's what my family encouraged me to do, right? Like, I think a lot of people, they you know, tell your kids to go just to college. You have a, a gym in your company? That's it. Well, right. Yes, yeah, so I brought exercise physiology to, to Mullen, present day Mullen. But um, so I'm a student at UNO, Hurricane Katrina comes, shuts UNO down, which was fortunate to me because it kind of gave me like a, a reprieve, right, from going to college and it allowed me to work. And anyway, this is a really long story that we probably don't have time for. But the, the brief version is that my mom has a friend who's a landscape architect and she's from Lakeview, a neighborhood in New Orleans where the levees broke and filled, you know, filled the neighborhood up with roughly 10 feet of water. Wow. Um, and so she resident in Lakeview. She was doing a lot of design work in the neighborhood months after the storm. She had some projects that needed to be built. She knew that I had a history in construction and, um, she tasked me with building these fortunately, like relatively simple, you know, landscape projects, mostly front yards and some backyards. And from there, I met, a, I met a landscape contractor, really small company at the most. I think we probably had three employees. I met him, I worked for him for roughly six months. Um, incredible experience. He, he took me under his wing almost immediately and really kind of groomed me with his knowledge of horticulture and sales and just customer service, and plant identification, et cetera. And um, encouraged me to, to take side work on my own, which was pretty incredible. And um, anyway, six, six or seven months into working for him, I had enough side work built up that I had a full-time employee on the weekends. And I think I had 12 weekends of work lined up. And so I went to Foster and you know, my, my boss and told him kind of what was going on. And he smiled and said, I'd, I've been waiting for this day to come. And uh, anyway, so I, I went off on my own and, you know, to tell you, this is kind of an important part of my story, but my, my initial vision was really one one thing my kind of my mission was just to do do for people what I wanted other people to do for me right like I want to treat the customers like I wanted to be treated and I want to take care of the employees like I you know like I kind of like Foster took care of me he was a great employer um, and I've had some tough employers in my in my history and he was not one of the tough ones right he was he was fair um, kind and and he did you know he was tough enough that he, he communicated what he expected, but he treated me well, which, which I appreciated. Um, and then talking about treating the customer, like I wanted to be treated. I, I remember years after like founding Mullen, I read about Jeff Bezos and kind of his mentality with Amazon and kind of how Amazon prime came about. It's because Jeff Bezos is impatient and wants things, you know, like right away. And so he built this prime platform to service customers who were like him. And that's kind of what I've built or what we've built with Mullen at this point, right? Is, you know, I have pretty high expectations and high standards. They're reasonable, but they're high. And, and that's, you know, that's what we've tried to deliver. Um, kind of embody throughout the organization, our people here and deliver it to our customers. Um, so, so I was, I was saying too, I'm talking a lot, Jeffrey, but maybe hey, that's my job. Maybe that's my job for the next hour, I hope. 
But um, so I started this company with the initial vision of two crews. I wanted to have a maintenance crew and an installation crew. And um, obviously it's, it's gone a little bit beyond that at this point, um, which is awesome. I'm, you know, I'm really proud of that fact. It's, it's really amazing. Yeah. So the economy in New Orleans, besides taking a, a hit with Katrina, I've been told it, that the recession, the Great Recession sort of bypassed New Orleans. Is that right? It did. I, I digressed off your question too. It it mostly bypassed New Orleans, I think. And I mean, keep in mind, what, 2007, 2008, I was 23, 24. So, you know, I was still, still pretty young. And I, I want to tell you when the recession like really hit, when I started reading about it, I think we had three or four employees, maybe five. Um, and, and so anyway, we were, I think that we were kind of shielded from the recession for the most part with the influx of money we had post hurricane Katrina, yeah. um, you know, where the government was pumping tons of money into rebuilding the city and insurance companies obviously were compensating, you know, the insurance with money to repair their homes and businesses. Um, I will say the one thing that I clearly remember that I took is kind of like a reaction or did as a reaction to the recession is at that point, at the point of the recession, I was mostly like selling, like not, I was not working on a truck with the crew. And I started doing one man jobs on my own. I'd get my crew set up just like I had done previously, but then I'd go and do irrigation repairs or flower planting or something to generate like a second, kind of a secondary stream of income, I guess. Um, and, and again, there was enough work fortunately that, and I was small enough that I was able to do that. Yeah, excellent. So you have, you said 200 employees. That's very impressive growth. Was it straight line up? Did it kind of go up, down and up? Did it curve? Knock on wood, it's never went down. Um, although the, the number at the bottoms went down a couple of times, right? As we've kind of learned some, learned some hard lessons that hopefully those are the ones that we remember the most. But, um, but no, it's, it's been relatively straight lined up. I mean, we've certainly had some sharp increases. We went 2020, we did a, a shade over 13 million. We jumped up $5 million in 2021 to, to 18.4, which is obviously a pretty big, pretty big spike. So we've certainly seen some pretty major increases, but it's been, we've steadily grown from inception. You know, you make it sound so easy. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> let's. Um, so let's just jump to the question of what are some of the mistakes or problems you've had to overcome? Yeah. So I'm trying to think there's a lot, right? I'm trying to, again, with only an hour worth of time, I'm trying to think which ones to hit on. I, I'll tell, I'll give you a story because I have lots of stories that is part of my story that I'll never forget that kind of relates to mistakes. So probably six years ago, we had experienced again, a tremendous growth year. I forget if we went, maybe we went from like, I don't know, Jeffrey four to six or 7 million or something, right? Tremendous growth. And so at this point we're doing so much work and we have so much like opportunity, so many sales coming through the door that lit, I, I'm almost embarrassed to say this, like damn near literally we're hiring anybody with a good resume. We're interviewing them and we're hiring them. Right. And, and several of these new hires, can remember hiring these people and not knowing like what position we were going to put them in. And these are, these are like management level candidates, right? It's not, not field labor type people. And so, you know, we hire this, this guy, I remember, and it's like, what do we, should he be an account manager? Should he be a project manager? Where should we put him? Cause we had so many jobs coming through. And again, we're just like hiring these people and interviewing them with the opportunity of management, hiring them and like plugging them in. And so we didn't have any great, we didn't have any great like accountability or system set up for what they were supposed to do in terms of their role. Like what did a win look like? What did a not win look like? We, we didn't have a budget built that really showed us how to pay for these people. Again, we're just hiring them as like, as a reaction to all this work. And um, man, that, that year we did, obviously, like I said, we've gone up every year, but we did the re most revenue we've ever done. I think by a pretty long shot, I think our, our net profit percentage that year was like 0 0.2. Um, it was not, was not the most lucrative year. You know, the year previous, we had probably done 40% less revenue and 
you know, exponentially more profit at the bottom because we just oh, weren't sure. managing our growth. So it hasn't always been easy. Yeah. yeah. I think you relate to me in, uh, in some prep work that you really had to learn the skill of uh, setting expectations. And so were you weaker in the beginning or were you like just too urgently over the top in the beginning? And where, how did you, where, where did you arrive at and how did you get there? Yeah, I think, so I think that historically, like my, my personality is one of like, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs, we're, we're almost like firefighters, right? We get really excited and we have these big ideas and yeah, we'll go, 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 go. And so again, I'm looking at all this revenue and I'm like, go, 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 hire these people. And, and I've learned to be a lot more patient. And I've also learned that, right, like really kind of like the growth needs to follow the systems to some extent. And sometimes we need to like slow, slow things down a little bit to make sure that we're doing them right. Um, but, you know, leadership, particularly like early in business, I, I was, I had a pretty like hard iron fist. I didn't put up with a whole lot, but, you know, again, I learned that for the most part, like not a hundred percent of the time, but for the most part, if somebody's failing in their position, it's probably a more of a process problem than a person problem. So if our processes are right and we're giving them the right structure and they're still failing, then it's probably an issue. But so we, you learn that, but what, what happened to help you learn that? I lost a couple of good people. <laughs> um, you know, I, we have a, we had a guy who was an account manager that, you know, at the time we had hundreds of residential accounts and each account manager had, I think a hundred accounts or something. And, probably at least, and, you know, residential maintenance isn't the easiest business. Um, you know, so for an account manager to manage that many customers who all have high expectations and pretty high demands on communication is, is just really tough. And so this, this guy who's just a gem of a gem of a guy, employee of ours, account manager, I can remember having some pretty hard conversations with him because I'd get complaints you know, from long-term clients that he wasn't whatever, answering them on time or getting them proposals or whatever it was. And ultimately I think that I kind of like crushed him, like squeezed him out of the door. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll never forget, you know, we're, we still have a good relationship today. Um, he does, he still doesn't work here, but, um, but maybe anyway, watch. What, maybe what is he'll that? come back after he listens. Uh, to no, the he got out of commercial landscape, but he works for the government now. I think he figured out he didn't like the pressure. He's not but, coming back. No, no. But I, I mean, seeing guys like him walk out of the door and then, you know, fortunately, I've, I've always kind of considered like where was my part in any mistake that's happened or any anything bad that's happened, like under my leadership or whatever. And that him leaving, that was the Gary is his name. Gary leaving was just a really big that was a kind of a pivotal moment for me in my career and, and kind of how I want to lead people and the kind of leader I want to be. Mm. Or not, or don't want to be. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you're commercial and residential. I would say that that's difficult for a company to be graded both. Um, now, I'm not saying you're not great at both, but how do you balance that? Um, what do you have to do to keep both areas strong and growing? And, and, and if you want to admit, is there one area where you do struggle in that I'm, I'm happy to so so on so we i started when i started the business we primarily focused on residential design build which is where like my initial passion was kind of sparked in landscaping um our our construction department is a little bit heavier this year will be about 60 percent commercial 40 percent residential um, i think that we do both really well however we have a we have a residential construction team and a maintenance construction team and they're different our maintenance project man or our commercial project managers they don't interact on residential jobs and vice versa um our maintenance is a little bit more difficult we do a very small amount of residential still uh, i think you asked recently about uh about residential maintenance and we typically only do like for our market, you know, really high end like estates, and and it's it's very difficult. Um, residential maintenance is I don't want to call it our Achilles heel, but it's it's a difficult business to manage, and 
you know, depending on the market too, I, you know, there are some markets, I suppose, Mariani's of the world that, that have done a really fine job. Um, your, your family's company is another one, you know, fine job at, at scaling residential maintenance, but we've had a hard time with it. New Orleans is not a big city that no. most people don't realize. This is a small, it's a big town is what it yes, is. That's it. And yeah. you, I mean, you look at property sizes, like your, your yard, Jeffrey, I don't know what the size of your lot is, but you know, small. 50 or yeah, 50 or 60 by like 110 probably. And that's kind of your average your average lot size. So it makes it pretty hard to have like a, a big enough ticket as a maintenance account to really justify having an account manager who doesn't need to have too many maintenance accounts to be successful. Yeah, yeah, we can spend a lot. Yes. We can we can pour a lot of money into the to my little property, but maintaining it's not as lucrative. Yes, exactly. So, uh, so how do you juggle that culturally having commercial and residential is it all the same it's just all the same values and it all works or is it you know like a brother and a sister who are all from the same parents but they're really different personalities it's like the brother and the sister um and it's funny because there's conflict there's certainly some conflict and some of it's like again like that brotherly conflict a bit but let's say between commercial construction and and residential construction um where maybe it's a sub that crosses over for both and right. The residential guys, they want Jeffrey Scott's house to get that subcontractor and the commercial guy says, no, 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 I need him to go to whatever the new Amazon facility to pour the sidewalks or um, whatever. And so there, there's a bit, there's a bit of conflict there where I think occasionally one. Are you doing one, the new Amazon facility? We are, but we're not pouring the sidewalks. <laughs> that was just an example. Um, but there's, a, there's definitely some conflict where occasionally like the residential guy, particularly residential, cause we started there where they'll feel, they'll feel a, a bit undervalued or underappreciated because they were such a big part of the business early on. Yeah. Um, but I, I think really like, it's just trying to execute really good work. Right. And that's, you know, I'll tell you this, and this is kind of like opening up being transparent with the listeners is we try really hard to over deliver for the customer. So you as a residential customer, Jeffrey, your expectations are going to be higher than let's say the Amazon as a commercial customer. So we want to, we want to give you 101% as the residential customer. We want to give them 101% as the commercial, which for you is an AA plus, And for them is probably a B or a B plus. Sure. Uh, I think to be competitive in both markets, again, unless you're in just some really tight niche commercial market, I, I think is kind of necessary and it's kind of like instilling that in the culture to not overproduce um, is can be tricky because it's, it is, it's so much different than that high end, you know, the Ritz Carlton experience where, you know, overproduction on, on a residential job, like it, it, you know, it should be kind of assumed, right. Mm -hmm. To me. Yeah. So you, how did you staff up for this very fast growth in what I'm, we're calling here a small market? Did you take people from outside the industry? Did, did all the competitors lend you a couple employees and that's how you got there? We've done both. We, um, we were pretty fortunate early on. There's a, a pretty strong competitor um, who, you know, they were big and we were small, not too far from your house was there where they were located, Jeffrey. But anyway, they kind of, they went mostly under and, um, and we were fortunate to gain or, you know, hire a handful of their their team members we um we have we have sought out people inside of the industry from outside of our market which sometimes works can also be really tough to get them to move to people think new orleans they think bourbon street um and then yeah i think that our biggest success has come from people who are out who are outside of the industry um uh, really big so really you know, like kind of thinking i'm thinking through like some of the some of like the key people we have here. Yeah, they had, when we hired, they had no landscaping experience. Give me like three examples, three industries. So we hire our, one of our, our senior estimator on commercial construction end. He was working for a contractor doing primarily McDonald's renovations. Um, we hired him really as a field level employee, knowing that he was on track for management. And so anyway, that was, I think over 10 years ago. Um, Eric, who runs our construction department, 
he came from a big civil contractor. He he ran an asphalt division for him. Same thing. He's he's running, um, like I said, our construction department. And then on, let, let's say like that. Well, I'll give you another one. We have a police officer, former SWAT team member. I think I've a, met him. John was a John. Yeah, I was going to say you might have met John at your house. Yeah. So John worked here very briefly before he went to the police force. So I will say that he has some landscaping experience way back when he was 20. But um, but anyway, yeah. So he was with the police force for, I think, close to 15 years and, and recently came back. And same thing, we put him on like the management fast track and, you know, to like talk about him for a minute. He received a ton of management training and he was actually in charge of some people development on the police force and on the SWAT team, right? So no landscaping, but still like people development. And so it's not that much, it's different, but not. And that's, you know, that's something we promote pretty regularly to prospects or candidates for jobs as we have, right? We have the horticultural knowledge, we have the construction knowledge. Um, you know, we, we just, we need them to help kind of fill seats. And we can yep. teach them, we can teach them or help them with whatever it is that they don't know. So how about Matt that was the crew leader in my job? Where is he from? So Matt is my neighbor, my former neighbor, who uh, he's, he's a good story. I can't give too much of the story away, but Matt had some pretty like hard times in his life. And um, anyway, he kind of came out of the hard times. We offered him a position with Mullen. This is shit, shoot five years ago. Yeah. And um yeah, he worked from, you know, lowest, lowest member on the crew up and, you know, up to where he is right now, which he's, he's kind of transitioning. He's still doing some residential jobs to fill in between commercial jobs, but it, commercial and just more lucrative. They can have more people in their crew. Yeah. But um, yeah, so he, he started today at a, a big, a city park job in Gretna. So yeah, pretty impressive. Yeah. He's Guy, yeah. Knew nothing. And now he's pretty, uh. So Matt, Matt is my crew leader of choice for my personal projects, Jeffrey. I think I'd like you to know that. Okay. Uh, yeah, he just ma makes good decisions, and you know, and again, he's and I say this as it relates to the podcast because he's he's a good person. He's got like the right mindset, right? Where it's something if he he may not want it that way on his house, he's going to stop and probably ask and say, "Hey, should we do it this way on Jeffrey's house?" Or again, if it's on the city park job and the whatever the plans seem wrong he's going to stop and not just keep running through the plans and call superintendent and say hey is this right and you know we'd rather have that than some guy with 15 years of landscaping experience that's arrogant and just does whatever he thinks he should do yeah without that's being great. a real team player nice 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 yeah. um <clears throat> i asked you before or, or you know before the podcast few things that make your company unique and you said quality that your quality standards are market leading so chase how do you know that what metric or observation do you have to ascertain that yeah i think the observe so metric would be pretty difficult um i mean it's certainly like right we survey clients hopefully you got your survey um if you haven't you'll be getting it soon but so we survey our customers but again like and certainly your eye is far more trained than 99.9% .9 of our customers' eyes, but how does a customer's um, perception of our quality, how, how do we really compare that to anybody else? So a big part of it is our perception in the industry. Like if we hire somebody from a competitor and they say, hey, we want to come to Mullen because we know you do it better and they start here and their eyes get big and they're like, wow, we never did X, Y, and Z and our former employer and that same thing um, we typically, when we onboard a new subcontractor, it's typically quite a process and it's, it's usually like kind of rough on the front end from a management perspective, just because the details that we require are so much more. Um, I mean, even stuff as simple as like highway mesh and dowling in the concrete or something that goes underneath flagstone, like you'd be amazed at how many other contractors, they just, they don't do it. They don't know about it. They don't do it. Mm. Um, and then some of it you can see in the finishes, uh, same same difference. Like let's just use flagstone. If you walk out and look at the joints in the flagstone, you go look at you know, if your neighbor gets some flagstone, you go look at theirs. Like you're probably going to see see a pretty positive difference in what we gave you. Gotcha. Yeah. So your your metrics are feedback from 
your clients, your employees, your growth uh, is could be considered a metric. Sure. And then you guys use your own standards. You look at what the marketplace is doing and do you try to just be better than everybody else or do you try to do the right thing re- kind of regardless of where everyone else is? The right. That's a good question. The right thing regardless of where everyone else is. Absolutely. Because there's, you know, there's certainly a point in, I should probably qualify this by saying like, I'm a construction guy. Like I said, I started the company with a real interest in residential design build. And I did construction before I got into landscaping. Um, and there's certainly a point of like overproducing and no longer giving value to the customer. And, you know, I think it's one thing to overproduce, you know, a couple hundred dollars, but there's something like that, but there's another, it's a whole other equation when, I don't want to start giving like in the weeds examples, but when you're just producing work that's so high quality that they'll never notice any difference, right? Like you don't need 10 inch thick concrete underneath your flagstone walkway. Like, yeah, sure. It'll cost two and a half times more than you paid, but there's, there's zero value that'll come from that. Mm-hmm. So I think just trying to do the, the right thing, like trying to offer maximum value. The other thing you said that was unique was your culture. You felt that you were kind of, on that issue or you called it a buzzword so i'll just use that term you're on that buzzword before it was buzzing uh so what does that mean like how did you if it wasn't out there if you didn't learn it from the industry you must have felt it was important what did you do early on and and what'd you do early on yeah so i think i think really being intentional with culture has been what's benefited us the most in terms of culture. Um, but, you know, really early on, we made a point and we still do the same thing, but we made a point to, to spend time and make time to ensure that the people who work here know how appreciated they are. We, um, and I mean, even something as simple, I was talking to a prospective hire earlier, something as simple as like the way we manage, like if you're doing your job and you're, you're meeting all like your metrics, we typically like, we allow a ton of flexibility. If you need to go, if you want to go to your, whatever son's T-ball game that starts at 4 PM, like go to the T-ball game. If one of the guys in our leadership meeting, isn't going to be here one day this week, he's got to like decorate Easter eggs with his daughter. So it's like, go ahead. You know, his division's performing really well. Like his, his team has it like, he's able to enjoy that. And so we, we kind of empower our people in like kind of an entrepreneurial way to take ownership in their position and then have flexibility as a result of that. But I think, I think a lot of that came from like treating people. Like I I was always a really good employee. I just did the job the best that I could. Um, And so trying to like, I guess, empower and inform people on what that looks like, empower them to do it. And then, give it to them and, and let them kind of run with it has been really important. Okay. So is that, is that the core of it? I th- yeah, I think that's, I think that's a big part. Again, and the intentional word is a really big piece of it where it's just, it's being intentional every year we sit down, we, we map out the whole year and employee engagement on a month by month basis. And what are we doing to really make sure that we're connecting the office team, the field team together that we're bringing families in. We're doing family oriented events. Like we're really making this, you know, like a, a nice, fun, solid place to work. And without like spending time and effort on doing that, I think it's really easy to just like do work. Oh yeah. Yeah. And for me, like I, I consider that a really big part of my job. Like if the culture's not, if the culture here isn't good, like I'm, <clears throat> that's a, a large part of my responsibility as the CEO. Mm-hmm. So I spend, you know, in turn, I spend time trying to make sure that it is good and healthy. Yeah. The, uh, the third thing you mentioned was communication, which I do a lot of consulting, uh, as you can imagine. I've worked with over 300 companies wow. and communication is always in the top three issues that needs help somewhere, somehow, you know, some are worse at it, some are terrible, uh, and others just need a bit of tweaking. And so... You, ha- you put that as one of your strengths. Um, what do you do? What's your secret sauce? Sure. So I recently, I don't know where I read this acronym. I wish I could remember, but um, there's an acronym for CEO and called it Chief Explanation Officer. Mm. But, you know, what do we do or what do I do? 
So we have regular meetings. We make the meetings a priority. Um, we have agendas for the meetings. So let's say like our leadership meeting this morning, like we talk about we talk about things that we're all doing as it relates to the business, important messages, things that they need to send out to their teams. I do regular email updates. We have regular town hall meetings. We have regular department meetings. Oh, 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 slow down. You do regular email updates. You mean to everybody or to everybody on computers? Everybody on computers, exactly. So that's we like a, week, a weekly uh, update? Monthly. Okay. Monthly update. So, so what's, what's the town hall? So town hall, we get together, we review our financial metrics, do it quarterly. Um, everybody in the office and all management personnel we review financial metrics. We talk about kind of what we did the previous quarter, what's upcoming the next quarter, initiatives, where we're going, any like important message that we need to send. And also we give them the opportunity, right? All of our people, the opportunity to share feedback. Um, so our, our field level employees, they have a big meeting every Monday um, with all management present. I, I go to that meeting at least once a month. And then they also have department meetings where we'll break maintenance and construction apart. And they do just a, it's roughly like a six minute um, kind of quick safety topic update daily, right? Hey, it's supposed to be rain today. Everybody be safe on the road. Um, you know, whatever. It's time of year to prune azaleas. Please make sure you're doing the hard cutbacks. Dean hasn't visited with you on site to show you how to prune his alias, please raise your hand and we'll have him come do it, whatever. Um, again, just to like keep it, keep it going and flowing. Anything else unique you do communication wise? We have, um, so we use Slack, which is almost like a Facebook type app um, sure. that we use to communicate internally. But no, I mean, again, <laughs> Does, I think Jeffrey and, you know, you can feel free to chime in. I'd love to hear your perspective if you have a different one. But I think a lot of this like secret stall stuff is it's, it's just, it's like an easy to do, easy not to do thing. So I think where a lot of companies like fail, I guess, right. Is it's just, it's easy not to communicate on a regular basis. It's easy to miss the meetings. It's easy not to have the one-on-ones. It's easy not to make sure that the field staff knows the same things that the, you know, the management team knows, et cetera. And I think that, you know, for us, what's so far has been the winning formula is just making sure that we don't not do those things. So we do kind of give the proper, you know, like time and value to, to the things that, you know, it's, it's hard to measure the value, but, you know, when you see guys like Matt that did your house, who's been here for five years now, Right. And all these other people who've been here and they can see a career and we're communicating what the career ladder is and yada, 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 yada. Yeah. You know, again, it's a little bit harder to quantify, but it's it's working. So, yeah, let me comment. Uh, there's a lot to say here. We could have a whole separate yeah. podcast on this. Um, <clears throat> I like what you said about chief explanation officer. I think that communication uh, has to almost feel like over communication. Oh my God, am I talking too much? Yep. You know, you, you have to, you have to really feel like, wait a minute, I've been saying this ad nauseum or, you know, am I going, is it too much should be the question in your mind sometimes. And then that's probably, then you're probably doing the right amount of communication. I always joke that many owners think that their employees have uh, ESP. You know, the owner says it once and then he thinks it 10 more times and the, he thinks that the employees are also thinking it 10 more times. Uh, and so obviously that's not true. And so that's why you have to over communicate. So it sounds like you're doing really, really good there. Um, also, and we'll get into this, that you've been able to put, pull yourself to work on the business. So you have really time to think about these things and and make make sure all these, would you say, can do, can't do, are doing, or happening, right? Right. It's like, how do you win a baseball game? Good fielding, good hitting, right? Turn the double play, learn how to turn the double play, learn how to run out when you hit a weak ball and run out to first base. And so uh, a lot of the basics, um, and I think people now more than 20 years ago needed even more, right? Or 10 years ago. And so you're using the technology. That's good. 
Um, yeah. You, I, so, do, you ever, do you ever feel like you're over communicating? Like, wow, is this too much? Yes. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you. So I have a friend who's relatively quiet guy too, but he's, he's CEO of a pretty large company. And one thing that he's really good about is their core values and their mission. And they have a thematic goal every year, um, twice a year. But anyway, I'll listen to him sometimes, like communicate with his people or he'll show me some of, some of like the things, the, the emails, memos that he writes. And it, it's so funny as he like hits on these core values and he's just like repeatedly cycling through like core values, core values, vision, 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 like telling them where they're going. I'm like, man, I mean, he's, he like, and again, being a quiet, I'm, I'm much less of a quiet guy than he is. And just being a quiet guy who's so, and, and I know why he does it because he's really smart and he's really intentional and he wants to make sure that there's no question on what those values are, like who you need to be to, to work for them and where you're going to go and where the company's going. Yeah. Um, it, it's, you know, he's, he's certainly been like a really positive influence watching his leadership on me. I think of it like the, I use the metaphor of a radio station. How long would you stay tuned in if the radio station went silent? Yep. That's good, Jeffrey. And so, uh, yeah, you got to keep, keep the message out there. Uh, you've done a, Again, great job of scaling the business. Um, and so you must have built a strong leadership team to A, have the time to do everything you just spoke about, but even just to get to the size this quickly, did you intentionally, did it happen by mistake? Did you go out and uh, hire proactively ahead of schedule, so to speak? Give us some insight. That was a very good question. So, so like I said, roughly six years ago, we were just hiring people hiring people because we had so much work and we didn't know how to produce it. And so quality has always been important to me. That was part of it, right? Like if we hire enough good management at, at the time, there were a lot more employees available than, uh, than there are today. So anyway, we're hiring these people and we're still like, we're still making mistakes on jobs. And I just, I couldn't figure it out. And so what I ended up doing is I, I engaged with some people like you who helped me understand like, what what the business needed to look like that we needed to have a real solid structured leadership team and i needed to get my hands out of construction and my hands out of maintenance and i needed to not be have finance so dependent on me etc and so so we built this team um we built this leadership team and and it was not the first team that we assembled there are a couple of them who are still with us well, no, most of them, I guess, are still with us, but there are several of them who are in different seats now. They're no longer on that team and they're they're doing great in the seats that they're in, but you know, they just weren't the right kind of personality fit for the leadership team. And so I'm, I'm saying this because we had to go through some trial and error, but as we eventually built a team of strong leaders who, um, you know, strong leaders who are kind of capable, able, empowered, and want to, to lead their port or part of the business you know it's working a lot better <clears throat> excuse me today than it was then so yeah anyway we we intentionally went out built a team had to replace some people on the team and you know which is actually it's funny i talk about gary the account manager who was kind of a pivotal lesson in business on how to not treat people we have a couple of these people that move you know, we have a senior account manager who was our, our maintenance division manager for a period. We have an estimator who's our construction head for a period. Both these guys, I mean, they're like gems of humans too. And they just, you know, they didn't, ex they, they didn't succeed in the, the role on this leadership team that they were in. And that's okay because the, the role that they're in now with the company, like, I mean, they're incredible. I couldn't ask for people better than they are. Yeah. Well, you did a, you, that's hard to do where you, you put somebody into a, uh, what's that called? Where you hit the uh, Peter principle, you hit, you know, you're, where you're over your head. Right. It's hard to do that and then keep them in your company. Yeah, I, I consider, that's why I consider them such big wins. Like, I, I think we're really fortunate that they stayed with us. And, and I, you know, I think it's been a symbiotic relationship, though, where, right, they're doing a great job for us and they're happy. They're happier they're in the right role how many right yeah right okay good how many uh people are on your leadership team 
Five. So I'm going to guess one is HR. Six, six include me. So we have one in HR. We have one over finance. We have one over residential design, build sales. We have one over construction, one over maintenance. So maintenance also does residential. They do a very small amount of residential. Okay. Gotcha. Any yeah, I, oh, go ahead. Say, say again. I was just moving on. Did you have something to say? No, I was going to say just because you asked the residential question. I think if our, you know, if we were doing $5 million a year in residential maintenance revenue, uh, we probably would have a right ahead of residential maintenance or something on that leadership team. But. So you have a branch in Baton Rouge, which for listeners is what, an hour and a half or an hour and 15 from your shop? Uh, hour and 15, correct. Um, is that a separate, is there going to be a branch manager on your leadership team or how does that fit in? So we do, we have a branch manager who's over Baton Rouge. He currently reports to our maintenance division manager um, where he's kind of like cutting his teeth, so to speak. And that's eventually he'll earn a earn a position on the leadership team. So then you'll have six. Oh, so he doesn't report to you. Will that person report to you or not? He'll. That's all internal in the works, Jeffrey. That's fine. Yeah, it's fine. yeah. yeah. I, I think. Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you this. I think that long term, I'll just tell you from a general business perspective and set up for us specifically. But I, I think that long term, a company of size, I think that. This and this is my opinion, but I think that a, a CEO, where they're, where they're able to kind of reduce their direct reports to C class to C level, you know, team members, I think the CEO becomes a lot more, um, I guess, like useful and successful. If that makes sense, um, I think that I think that too much like in the weeds and in the details management for probably most CEO personalities can really kind of like bog them down and hinder them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, you know, obviously a company needs to be to the point where it can like substantiate that, that level of team. So there's a whole, not debate, but there's a whole trend in the industry. Hey, I should have a, a COO or general manager or no, I don't need that. Right. And the trend is towards that, but I see also see plenty of successful companies where it's team led. And in fact, if you look on uh, the fortune 500, it's the CEO is not necessarily separated by a COO, but that doesn't matter. We are not them, but still right. for comparison, it's, it's interesting to know that. Do you have a vision for yourself on that? Yeah. I mean, I, I'll tell you, like, I'm definitely, so I'm sure you probably read rocket fuel and there's a visionary and an integrator. And I, I'm certainly like, I can integrate. I've, you know, I've proven over the last 15 years that, that I have that capability, but sure. I think that my real strength lies and my vision casting and I, I do I mean I, I think you know just to be like frank with it I think at this point we've built a brand that's pretty well like idolized in the industry and you know I, I say this because I've had you know a number of people tell me this firsthand that like they love to be you know they love for their company to be part of the Mullen brand and so I, I think that what you'll see from us over the next you know, two, three, five, 10 years is I think that you'll see us move markets probably mostly through acquisition, maybe some organic movement. I think you'll see a, you know, as, as we expand our footprint geographically, I think you'll see a number of companies roll up under the Mullen brand and we'll be able to give them all the special things that we've done here. You know, we'll be able to give there. And I, I think. You mean they're me, all going to get a, a gym? Maybe I can't promise a gym in every company, but I think, you know, it's pretty cool, Jeffrey. I really, I really envy what you do for a living. I think it's awesome where you get to go in, you know, you're working with these business owners and their teams and you're improving their lives. Right. I mean, that's exactly what you're doing. You're taking some people who are semi-successful, others who probably aren't, and you're making them really successful and helping them have more time to spend with their families and, you know, build a stronger business to support their teams, give customers better service, et cetera. And that's, you know, what you're doing is exactly aligned with like my initial vision where it was just give customers and employees something better than they could have somewhere else. Yeah. As I've like really thought about it, I'm like, Hey, why not? Like if we're doing it here with 200 people and you know, whatever, a thousand customers, like why don't we do it in Baton Rouge and Mobile and the Panhandle of Florida and coastal Georgia and, you know, start rattling off all these different places, Texas, where I think that eventually you'll see us. Um, 
why not? Right. If we're going to, if we're going to give people the best experience in new Orleans, why not give them the best experience everywhere else that it, it makes sense to be. I like it. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Excellent. So uh, do you have a, have you started that yet? We have, we do. We, so we have, a, we have a couple different target markets identified and, we're, we're currently like in process on, on trying to be in those markets. So is Baton Rouge your test case? Baton Rouge. So Baton Rouge is a little bit different. Um, I mean, certainly we could call it a test case, but you know, we wound up in Baton Rouge because we had a number of clients, strategic partners who asked us to be there. And so over the last couple of years, we've, we've kind of given in and, you know, accepted, I guess, their invitation, their invitations to work for them there. Mm. And um, based on the volume of work that we did, it just, it made sense to, you know, put a location in Baton Rouge and hire somebody to manage it. I think one of the issues is how you manage install versus maintenance. I think maintenance from a branch perspective, easier to do. Yes. And install uh, knowledge centers aren't easily equally distributed in, in how you go about that. So I've seen... In some cases, a um, sort of a hybrid matrix, matrix org chart in terms of how you manage install in the different geographic areas, whatever. you Not something you have to solve today, but something you'll probably have to deal with as you grow. Absolutely. Our current makeup in Baton Rouge, like you asked about the Amazon job. We have this big Amazon facility in Baton Rouge that, that we started about a month ago. So the crews that are working on that are crews from New Orleans, right? They're staying in Baton Rouge, but they're crews from our home base here. And that's for the foreseeable future, unless something changes, that, that's our plan. Like we're going to service construction jobs with our, with our current construction crews, our like HQ construction crews, but we're going to build organically a maintenance branch in Baton Rouge in, in, in terms of like potential targets. You know, most landscape companies aren't pure maintenance, right? Most most companies, even if they're maintenance heavy, they still do 20% construction or something like that. But um, certainly certainly the companies that we're most interested in in other markets are, are maintenance centric companies, commercial sure. maintenance. Do you find that when you send your crews out of town, they get the work done quicker? Yes, <laughs> they do. <laughs> yeah, too bad you don't have install crews in Baton Rouge. You could send them down to New Orleans. In New Orleans, right? Yeah, yeah. They're ready to go home. They want... They want mom to cook dinner for him again. The question, you know, it's sort of a hypothetical question, but how do you reproduce that so that your in-town crews could operate that same way? Uh, you know, I don't know, but I, I mean, I can tell you like, so we call them super crews, which, which again, Matt's like a super crew leader in training, but these couple of super crews that we have, the, the people who run the crews, I mean, they're, they're just, they're leaders, man. I mean, they're really, really strong. Mm. And I, I do think that they would, they, they get their in-town jobs done really quickly, but again, they're strong, they're well-paid. Um, but yeah, if we could have every crew operating at that level, that'd be, we, we'd be, I'd be talking to you from Maui right now, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it'd be pretty awesome, which, but again, that's like, that's kind of the challenge in business, right? As we try to like continually develop our people and, you know, we hope that some of these greener crew leaders can eventually kind of work their way into the super crew position and, you know, become what, what some of these guys that we have now are. You know, it's interesting being, I think it's important to be uh, a consumer for me, as well as a consultant. So I've been in the inside, I've run, I've consulted, but I'm still a consumer and I'm still currently consuming. And it just brings you back to your uh, reality. My last landscape company, no names. Uh, I know they did profit sharing company wide, which sounds sort of, it sounds uh, like, wow, what a great thing. And it's just all win, no, lo no losing that, you know, win, win. But I can tell you that they definitely cut some corners ongoingly in my company and my, uh, my property. Mm -hmm. And so you have to, as a, you have to manage that. Even the, the best intentioned incentives, I'm really changing topics here, but yep. the best intentioned 
uh, incentives like that, you, you culturally, you really have to make quality, which you said is one of your key strengths. Man, you've got to embed quality so strong that any incentives you do will never pull you off course, right? Right. Um, I, you don't even have to share, but do you do any kind of incentives? And, you know, I, I have no idea. I'm just asking. We, we do, but certainly like those callbacks, right? That, that kind of dings, that, that dings the company and in turn that dings the incentive plan. And I was going to say, cause I'm, I'm familiar with, with that company, of course, but one thing, and I feel like we were kind of on the, yeah, for, for our market, we were on the early end of it, but to develop this layered management system, which, which again, like nationally at this point, like most landscape companies over probably a couple of few million dollars have some kind of layered management system. But again, we'll, we'll pick on Matt, your crew leader. I think Matt does excellent work. I think Matt makes decisions fairly consistent with like the decisions I would make. But frankly, Jeffrey, like I worked in the field and I occasionally would have like a, a really high standard customer come out and say, hey, why is the such and such not right? And I'd go look at it. I'm like, man, I, I don't know, but let me fix it. And so I think and my point is, it's just having like another set of eyes on top of the eyes, particularly the eyes that are working outside. It's hot, it's cold, it's rainy, it's windy, it's whatever, pressure to get to the next job, managing three other people doing something and you're trying to do something. I think having that like additional set of eyes really helps like drive that, that quality standard up. And that's, you know, like for us on, on residential projects, we have that original salesperson who sold you the job that you know, our, our design build salespeople all have at least degrees in landscape architecture. So we have their eyes on the job. And then we have a superintendent's eyes on the job. These are trained construction people. And then we have the crew level eyes on the job and so what we hope is that we can catch most things not all because we're not perfect but most things before the customer does right that we see them and fix them before you come out and say hey what about this but i think being dependent on crew level to manage themselves is pretty tough matt definitely uh you know he's a thinking crew leader right, right. so he had some good ideas yeah. And, uh, you know, without saying too much, I said, what do you think about that? He's like, yeah, I was thinking the same thing. And so he's definitely thinking and, hub, you know, kind of like a good football player, you know, can kind of swivel and see the whole right. field. He, he can see the whole field. It's, I, I could, we could go on about him for a long time, but, you know, again, if we're doing, if we're doing things the right way, we're teaching guys like him. And I, I, I know because I've known him personally, the entire, he's actually one of my workout partners in the gym. But I've, I've known him personally since he started here. And he didn't do that when he started, right? He's, the guy's an incredible worker. I mean, he was like head down, you know, shovel or pickaxe in hand, just grinding. And so we've really had to spend time like teaching him, Matt, when you have a crew underneath you, you got to have your head on that swivel and you got to watch those people and give them direction. And, you know, ultimately the job will move along faster as a result of you slowing down a little bit. Um, so it's been, you know, Watching guys like him like develop is, is pretty awesome. I thought he was speaking Portuguese to his crew. He's and I thought he was Portuguese. I said, Are you Portuguese? Like, no, I'm a, I'm American, but I'm speaking Spanish. Yeah. It must be the New Orleans accent. It just sort of yeah. came out soft and you know he went to a, uh he went to a school called Rummel, where we have it's a parochial school in Metairie. We have a, a lot of guys from Rummel and we tease them that they speak Rummel because that it's like a New Orleans dialect, but anyway. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned that you studied exercise physiology. My son's, uh, and he's in school studying exercise science. He's he's huge, mm -hmm. and uh, he loves he loves landscaping. You know, I, I was going to say we have a great we have a great position for him when he's done. I, I'm going to bring him. We when do. He's done. Oh yeah, yeah, or when he's not. You know, we're kind of yeah. like he's he's at it. He's working at it. He's trying. His mom. He lives in Tampa. His mom would love him to move to New Orleans. Would she? and study here and he could work for you part-time that'd be great he could work out at your gym he could we'd like that i need i need a young kid to push me along i'm getting old he, he's, I need uh, the competition. he's huge for is it? for his size I and mean, he's big yeah of course for my size everybody's yeah, everybody's bigger i like that so give us your predictions for the industry for the future let's uh what's your predictions where are we going where's the industry going what do you 
What do you foresee? So I would have never told you this a year ago, but I, I do think that we're going to end up going all electric is, is going to be a while, but I, I really think that we're going to end up going the route of lower emissions. You know, we're going to see more and more electric mowers, electric handhelds. So I think we're going to see electric trucks. Um, last week I was at, at a meeting in Miami with, um, with some pretty like prevalent business leaders from around the world. It was a president, I think, not CEO, but president of one of the largest trucking companies in Canada, freight companies. And he was talking about electric trucks and how they're trying to develop trucks to have enough torque to go up the mountains in Canada to, to make these hotshot deliveries. And I think the government's going to invest in the infrastructure to put charging stations throughout the country. And anyway, you know, having conversations like that really makes me believe that, you know, that coupled with all the other, you know, paraphernalia and media that we see on electric equipment, I, I really think that we're going to see, we're going to be a much you know, more electrified, I guess, call it, um, industry. So are you, are you going to put uh, solar panels on your, on your uh, box trucks? You might see some solar panels somewhere with Mullen in the future. I, I've always really enjoyed trying to be on the environmental end. I mean, obviously like, you know, our lifeblood is the environment. Mm -hmm. um, so I think to try to be a good steward of the environment for me has been really important. But you might, I mean, we, you know, we use our residential crews primarily use electric equipment, although occasionally we'll find them sneaking a piece of gas powered equipment because it's still electric's not quite, not quite up to par with, with uh, gas as power yet. But what about electric mowers, at least residentially for these little lots? Yeah. So that same thing. We have electric push mowers for residential crews, which same deal. They're just, they're not quite as powerful, but still our, our equipment I think it's three years old at this point. I, I guarantee you batteries today are better than they were three years ago. So I, I think if we, you know, we change that equipment out next year, I think we'll see that we'll get more power out of the new stuff. And I think to me, that's like one of the big, one of the major movements of the industry. The other thing I've noticed that I don't think you read about like a lawn and landscape is, or a landscape management is I, I really think, and Jeffrey, you can speak to this on the consumer end, but I, I think that the landscape industry, we're getting like a lot more sophisticated. You know, when I started in the landscape industry, really, we were just like any other subcontractor, or a painter or whatever, where, you know, most landscape companies were, you know, probably five to 10 employees at the most. They were, you know, sub million dollars, certainly sub like $2 million in revenue and didn't have great systems, didn't have good technology, you know, again, with some outliers in some of these big markets, but I've noticed even like our competitors locally, like, you know, there's plenty more or plenty of whatever, 20 to 50 employee companies. And, you know, some of these owners I know, and they're real leaders. Um, it, it's just the level of sophistication in our industry has certainly increased, I, I think. Oh, yeah. So, yeah hugely. Big time. so how do you, let me just keep with this question, because it's really my last question. So how do you you have a prediction where we're going to go with that sophistication? No, I, I think I don't. But I'll tell you like one prediction I have. I think that consolidation is, you know, just in, all, in, in a lot of industries is becoming more prevalent. I think we're going to see a lot more consolidation in the landscape industry. I think that I think if you're a two, two, three, five, six million dollar business and, you know, and you can't get it to. 25 or 30 on your own, I, I think that you're going to realize, I think a lot of these owners are going to realize that their best bet is to roll up with one of these platform companies. And I mean, there's, you know, we could go on about this for hours, but I think we're going to see that where it's kind of like either you get on the train or you get run over by the train. Um, yeah. it, and it, I think, Oh, sorry, keep going. I was going to say, I think a lot of it is just that, you know, I think that COVID has really helped really helped a lot of investors and private equity companies. It's, it's helped them understand like how resilient our industry really is. The fact that we, you know, we saw an uptick with COVID mm. and in lieu of a downturn. And so particularly with how much money is available in the market right now, I think that a lot of them are kind of chomping, chomping at the bit to be part of the, the whole recurring revenue model in the green industry. So It's interesting. I'm in the middle of, uh, of uh, writing a sort of a white paper on this. Um, you're definitely right in everything you just said. Uh, and 
there's sort of this sexy trend of let me build up and sell my company and and then I've and then I've hit the uh, rainbow, right? Or the pot of gold at the end of the right. rainbow. But who's who's making the better investment? The person buying or the person selling? You know, it's a rhetorical question. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that's why I was like, I can't give you that answer. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do think there's, uh, I mean, yeah, there's some stupid money going around. I mean, I have right. a friend who just sold his business and it's like, they gave you what? I would take that deal 10 times. Right. Uh, but it's sort of those crazy deals out there that everyone hopes, Hey, I hope I get one too. And, uh, especially if you're younger, I mean, if you're 65, okay, you want to just find the easy way out. But if you're younger, uh, I would be thinking like you're thinking as opposed to like, they might be thinking. Right. So, um, that's all. I mean, I'll, I'll get, I don't want to negate your what you're trying to do there, I mean, I think you should. Yeah. Because I think, you know, there's, is selling the right, because when you sell your company, then what? What do you do with that money? Well, and I mean, I'll, I'll like, I'll tell you this, because maybe this will help some people want to call us. But uh, but to me, you know, and I, I dealt with that as the like five to $6 million company, right? I was owner led. I didn't have an appropriate leadership team. How do I find the leadership team? How do I build the company? And so I think to have, some kind of guidance from somebody like us who's done it before and can really help like better structure that company. Now, if I were that owner, I'd be looking at us saying, Hey, so what's in it for me, right? Yeah, great. I get to take some chips off the table, you know, in the form of whatever millions of dollars, but like what's in it for me long-term. Yeah. So that's what we're looking for is these, like these entrepreneurs who, you know, are kind of struggling, I think a little bit or don't really know how to get it to the next level. You know, we can come in, we can help them again, give them better quality of life, give their team better benefits than they had, better systems, structure, metrics, et cetera. Well, if they're tired of being an owner, they, they can call you. But if they want to be a better owner, they can call me. That's it. Wow. There you go. They call both of us, Jeffrey. <laughs> sure. They, they should. That would be wise. Yeah. 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 Uh, which I like. Um, yeah. Like I said, that's, you know, as I considered, like, what's my future? I really, I've just, I'm really into like helping people. I do a lot of stuff way outside of the landscape industry and inside of it, Yeah, help others. And I'm like, this is pretty cool. Like now I can kind of take, I can, I can take what's worked here and helping these people inside of the company and some of this knowledge that I've learned over the last 15 years. And I can also start to bring others in and other places and help them and their teams too. Oh, for sure. You know, I, you never picked up that check or asked for that check, by the way. Uh oh. I was donating to one of your charities. I forget what it was. Oh, I remember I can't that. Remember yeah. yeah. With the check emails. I thought it was for your job. I'm like, we better get that check. <laughs> I am not that person. You're talking to the wrong uh, household member no, no. there. No. Oh, fair enough. You're a smart <laughs> man. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Hey, listen, I appreciate, um, appreciate you coming on. Any final words you want to leave for someone who's, they're not ready to sell, but they're just like ready to go to the next level. What, what's your yeah, parting? Absolutely. Wisdom? So, so you asked me like special sauce for me and there's a couple things again, that when I started doing this, I don't think there was as much of it available as there is today, but I, I think a lot of guys or a lot of people, um, business owners are probably hesitant, right? Do I, do I pay that much to join one of Jeffrey's peer groups or does it really make sense to bring Jeffrey in to whatever, come help with my business. And that's, I'm not the smartest entrepreneur in the world. I just, I've been really fortunate that I've been smart enough to know how to look elsewhere for people who can help me do some of the things that I haven't been able to figure out. So I would, I would highly encourage anybody who's like considering it, that peer to peer network and a peer group, one of your peer groups, Jeffrey, I think would be, you know, it's huge. It's been huge for me. And same thing, I think bringing someone in like you, who's done it time and time and time again, with, like you said, over 300 companies, like, if, if you're an owner and you're stuck, you know, why, why do you need to figure this out on your own? Why not get the, why not get the guy that can show you how to climb the mountain? So there is, there is a amazing self-reliance ethic yeah. to the detriment that is just out there. Yes. I will figure this out. Gosh, darn it. If it's the last thing I do. And sometimes it is the last, I have gotten calls from people and I, I got a call from somebody and like two months later, the number was out of order. Like well, it was the last thing he did. Yeah. And I mean, some people probably hear this and think it's an exaggeration, but it's like, 
do you really, do you not spend $10,000 to save a million? Yeah. I mean, that's not, and it's you, I'm sure, you know, with some of your past experience, like that's not an exaggeration. So, you know, I think that there's a lot of opportunity to either make more money or save money or save our businesses or, you know, whatever, just make it, you know, I, I can tell you five or six years ago, you know, we were starting to kind of unravel a little bit and I was really lucky that I saw that and I was willing to like take action and, yep. you know, button it all back up and, and got yep. it going in the right direction. And it's I couldn't have done that on my own. It's the same thing with many investments. I'm, I was, I coach a, uh, owner in he's near new york city and we had to bring in this key position and he thought and this is only well this is very recently and he thought you know 75 80 85 90 125 is what we had to pay mm -hmm. for that person oh my god this person that's come in is just boom changing the whole lifting the whole culture up you know the owner's got somebody that's like Oh my God, this guy's operating at such a high level. Right. You no, know, I'm raised up. Other people are raised up. And, and so uh, we worry too much. Uh, what is it? The numerator, not the denominator. We worry mm -hmm. too much about the investment and not the return on investment. And if, if you're willing to think outside the box, you can grow in leaps and bounds in so many ways. Very true. Yeah. Well, really, I appreciate the time today, Jeffrey. It's always, it's enjoyable to talk with you. Um, so I, I definitely appreciate appreciate the opportunity both to talk with you and for you know, all the listeners to, to hear our conversation. Great. Hey, this has been excellent. Chase, yeah, likewise. thank you so much, man. You're welcome. Thank you, Jeffrey. Have a good, have a good afternoon.